Okay, so okay, so welcome back to your uh, economics lesson on economies of scale. Uh, before this presentation, you should have been on the uh, the website reseonomics.eu, and then you look on the left for European economics lesson number nine, first of April. Uh, and this is now the presentation on the battle between Airbus and Boeing. So, as I mentioned in the introduction, uh, Boeing controlled over 90% of the world uh, commerce in uh, commercial airliners, and that's because they of, they had the production capacity after Second World the Second World War. The USA was producing. Uh, military material, airplanes, ships, tanks uh, for the uh, for the Second World War. This meant at the end of the Second World War, the European Union was mostly destroyed, or the European countries, and the USA was the only country with industrial capacity, and uh, that's why they then controlled the market uh, with Boeing, the first commercial jetliner, which was launched in 1958. Uh, like Airbus later on, they were involved in uh, space programs like the Apollo program. They produced also uh, hydrofoils, submarine hunters. And uh, competition began in the 1980s when the European Union decided to use the, it, its size to compete with Boeing. And as I mentioned before, Boeing didn't believe in the business plan producing wings in Wales and fuselages in Germany and putting it all together in France for them with countries that didn't even speak the same language. They laughed at it. They didn't believe it was a serious threat. And here are some of Boeing's uh, clients. Now, as an airline, when you're going to buy an airplane, first of all, you need to order it well before the date you need it because it has to be built it has to be built to your design. You have to decide for your aeroplane. You're going to have either a long distance or a medium distance or a short distance plane. Um, but that depends on their capacity of how far they can fly. You then have to decide how, many, how much room do you want to give to uh, first class passengers or business class or, or economy class. Um, and uh, then how do you want it to be fitted out and furnished and so on. That's part of your, your order. Here we can see uh, the Airbus brief history. So it starts as an agreement uh, as a European consortium of French and German and later on Spanish and UK uh, companies. As we saw in the introduction, the UK already had some technological uh, competence as it had worked with the French to provide uh, to produce Concorde um, and it was originally owned by the, by EADS the European Aeronautic Defense and Space Company and um, it's always quite difficult to separate the uh, operations of Airbus from uh, its other operations both military operations and uh, its work in space for example in the Galileo satellite navigation system and it's based in Toulouse in France where they put the planes together and here we can see a, a brief history I'm going to go through this fairly quickly the objective was quite clear the objective for Airbus was they wanted to take over 50% of the world market from Boeing and because Boeing had had all the market, it hadn't been particularly, particularly innovative, and uh, Airbus were using new materials, new composites, they had a different cockpit, cockpit system, uh, which meant one pilot could f who could fly an A320, it's the same cockpit for an A340, uh, which uh, meant that it was much cheaper to prepare your pilots to fly the plane, so in fact, um, uh, the U.S. was, was uh, quite surprised by the technological uh, prowess of Airbus. And then, what are you going to produce? You've got basically the 
uh, the small aircraft, less than 100 families, so the 100 uh, uh, passengers. This would be for flying uh, point to point. For example, you're flying from uh, uh, Nantes to, to Toulouse. Uh, and this is the uh, A320 family. One aisle down the middle, not too many passengers. You then have the A330, A340, the A300, the A310, which are middle-sized uh, planes. And then you get up to the really big plane, the biggest commercial uh, uh, aircraft in the world, the A380. What you produce depends on your strategy of trying to understand the future of the world market. Now we talk in terms of hub, hubs and points. A point is a small um, uh, airport, might not even have runways long enough to take in the big aircraft. Um, and uh, a hub is where people will fly into, it's got big capacity, so you take uh, Charles de Gaulle in Paris or Heathrow in London, and they are called hubs. So the question is, where is the market? Is it hub to hub, in which you fly large numbers of passengers at the same time in a big plane from one hub to another, but then the passenger has to get to the hub, so they might take a flight from a point not to a hub, Charles de Gaulle, and then they fly to another hub, Heathrow, from which they then go to another point, Swansea. So uh, the, there was a difference in strategy, and basically Airbus got it wrong with the A380. They wanted to, f they thought the future was large volumes of, of, of uh, passengers flying hub to hub. And the Americans thought it was more likely to be point to point. But if you're going to fly point to point in a small plane, is it going to be just in between cities in the USA, or can you fly long distances? And that's where the Americans invented the Dreamliner to do a point to point long distance flight. So it, it's all about trying to predict the market, knowing that to create a plane takes years of design, of engineers, of testing, of setup costs, of course. So you need to predict the market well in advance. And here are the, the clients, basically, uh, that chose Airbus. Uh, again, if your planes use the same parts, then it means that your spare parts and maintenance costs are reduced as well. Interesting, Airbus is sold it's built in euros and it's sold in dollars. This made it very easy for clients to be able to compare the difference of price. It also meant, of course, if the value of the euro goes up against the dollar, then you simply have to cut your profits because you're selling in, in dollars and vice versa. And here we have a little comparison. Uh, of the number of employees, Airbus about 57,000, Boeing 166,000. Boeing was pushed quite quickly into reducing its staff, trying to reduce production costs. It was easy to have lots of employers, uh, employees when you were a monopoly, but with competition they had to uh, uh, start rethinking uh, that. And of course the number of aircraft in circulation Boeing has far more uh, because it was producing aircraft before Airbus even started. Um, and uh, now both companies, as I say, they're both involved in military aircraft and also in space. And if you look here, I've taken the example of Air France uh, in terms of um, its long haul fleet. So a long haul is hub to hub flights, and at the moment it's got the Boeing 777, 47%, the Airbus A330 and 200, the 340 and 300, and Boeing 747s. Of course, the, the recent uh, experiment by Boeing of changing one of its Boeing uh, Boeings was a complete disaster, and is going to cost Boeing a lot of money after its accidents. Here's Air France's medium haul fleet with the A318, the A319, and the very successful A320. 
the A321 and a few Boeing. So basically Airbus took over the uh, medium haul fleet. And here's as a little example because for every type of plane in terms of how many corridors in the plane do you have two floors like in the A380 uh, uh, you can compare one plane uh, to another so the 777 against the A340 the Boeing 767 against the Airbus A330 and I've given you a comparison of how many passengers, but again, the number of passengers depends on the client and what sort of passengers they want. If you're flying in a, a, a Ryanair, um, then of course they want to fit you all in like sardines. There's probably not going to be um, space for uh, customers who are going to pay much more to have more space. Um, so these are averages, if you like, or total capacities. The other thing was the difference of uh, fuel. F uh, aviation fuel is expensive, even though it pays zero tax, which is something that I think that should be changed, but there we go. Um, the Airbus was more fuel efficient, uh, and in fact, many of the Boeings also fly on Rolls-Royce motors, which come from the United uh, Kingdom. They've also experimented with Airbus, flying Airbus using um, biofuel as well. So we then end up with a war. The Americans were surprised about the competition from Airbus, but they still had 50% of the market. The small players, Bombardier, uh, uh, Embraer from Brazil, weren't really serious uh, competitors. The future f competitors were certainly, going to, were certainly going to be China and to an extent uh, Russia. We'll look at that in a moment. So, the war starts. Now, as we've seen in previous lessons, a company cannot go to the WTO to start a trade war. The company goes to its government, the government goes to the, European, to the WTO to launch a war. Most trade wars you'll see, if you look at trade wars, involve the USA, China, and the European Union. So, what happens first of all? The USA, I think it's because they were pretty worried about the production of the A380. Uh, uh, they uh, got their government to complain to the WTO about setup costs for the Airbus planes. Now, setup costs were basically, it takes years to prepare a plane. You can imagine how long, how much money you need to spend in terms of architects, in terms of design, of engineers, of testing before a single plane can be sold, you need millions and millions of pounds, or euros, or dollars. So, the setup costs were provided by the European uh, Commission, by the ECB, but they're repayable upon the sale of each plane. It was considered illegal because if a project failed, and there were no sales, then both, basically those setup costs wouldn't have to be paid back. However, if a project was very successful, like the A320, the, the funds, at, because the price of each plane sold includes a percentage of the setup costs, well, once the setup costs are paid, you continue to make profits, if you like, uh, for, your, uh, for, the, for the people who provided the, the finances. So the USA take Europe to court. Okay, so Boeing complains first, and Airbus, the following day that Airbus knew this was coming, Airbus, via the European Union, the following day, make a complaint to the WTO that Boeing had hidden subsidies coming from uh, national sources, particularly from the Pentagon. It was very difficult to see some of the money that was going through defense or through research and development uh, into actually helping Boeing reduced the costs or the prices of its planes it was selling, in which case it was unfair competition. So Airbus retaliates, and the WTO says, oh no, this is going to be a very messy uh, war, very technical, 
complicated and very long. And it's actually uh, just been, uh, this, this slide was made beforehand, in fact, in uh, uh, 2019, the decision was made, basically both sides have won, the Americans won because they, it was decided that the, the set-up fees paid, provided by the European Union were illegal, uh, the WTA also agreed that the Pentagon subsidies to uh, or, or government and regional subsidies to Boeing were also illegal, so both sides won. And later on in the lesson, uh, you're going to look through the actual document concerning the recent um, findings by the WTO many, many years later and how much money uh, the Americans are allowed to now charge the Europeans, if you like, in retaliation. But while the two giants are fighting, Airbus and Boeing, what are the others doing? We have basically the threats from China, Japan, Brazil, Canada. And what is the model going to be? Is it going to be high cost point to point. These are your small jet liners flying rich people around because they haven't got the time to go to a hub. Uh, so they're willing to pay, or their company, to pay a lot of money for uh, the dream liner type of plane produced by the Americans. Is it going to be hub to hub because it means you've got the long journeys but at reasonable prices like the A380? Is it going to be hub and spoke? You take a spoke into the hub from the hub, you go to another spoke. What is the big? What is the model? And of course, everyone tries to to estimate the future market trends in terms not only of where the future market is, and I think everyone's quite clear the future market is in China. Uh, they already uh, account for twenty five percent of Airbus sales. We produce Airbus in China, which we'll talk about later on. Um, and which planes are going to be um, needed? Hub to hub, the big planes, the middle sized planes, or the small planes? And also at the moment, there is a problem for the European Union. They're trying to fight global warming. In order to fight global warming, they have to reduce CO2 emissions, but aeroplanes produce a lot of CO2 emissions and flights are increasing enormously and we don't tax kerosene used to fuel aeroplanes in the same way that we don't tax maritime fuel used to provide goods going by ship around the world but we do tax people for driving their cars or for driving lorries so uh, if in the future there is a decision a world decision to actually start taxing kerosene then it could also have a major impact on the air industry. And here we can see basically uh, the, the trends expected in the future. I'll let you look at that when you have a bit more time, saying basically uh, where uh, most deliveries are most and where most seats are going to be bought in the future. So strategy, the strategy Boeing focuses on point-to-point -point system. This is the, the Dreamliner, which is, as I say, a long haul. Long haul means you have the capacity to travel long distances, but it doesn't mean you have to be a big plane. So the Dreamliner was a point-to-point -point long haul plane. Uh, and the Airbus decided to build the A380, which is incredible when you see the A380, a giant plane, and they are stopping production because it doesn't work. People didn't want the A380. The idea of having lots of people on the same plane to go to hubs was a decision, basically, that has not found the right market and that Airbus has decided to stop production. You can imagine the cost of preparing the production, uh, the design, and so on, and suddenly saying, wisely, I think, OK, we made the wrong decision, let's stop. Now, what about China? Um, Boeing basically was selling their planes to, to China, 
and much of the material to make a Boeing was coming from China. You can see here the tail section, the vertical fins, the stabilizers, um, and the engine manufacturers uh, such as General Electric, Rolls-Royce, Pratt & Whitney are also being subcontracted in China. So what does Airbus do? Now, we all know without wanting to be prejudicial against the Chinese, the Chinese are very good at copying technology. Airbus had the problem. The market is in China. If we build Airbuses in China, we know the Chinese will steal our technology, copy our technology to make their own commercial airliners. But if we don't produce Airbus in China, then Boeing might, and they might take over the market, and this is where the future market is. So uh, Airbus decided Airbus is being produced in the United States and in China. Uh, understanding perfectly well that every time that the, the, the Chinese build an Airbus, they are learning about uh, airplane technology to produce their own plane. So the advantages of building in China, and these are not being built in China to come back into Europe, this is for the Chinese market. Uh, higher productivity, lower costs, uh, uh, but also perhaps uh, lacks government control, but a springboard to capture the Chinese market uh, amounting to $280 billion and catering for 100 million tourists and growing. The risk is you decrease control of your production, costly training, you have to set up uh, production lines, you have to train the people, and a transfer of technology to a possible competitor, well a definite competitor, Airbus knows perfectly well that the biggest future competitor, apart from Boeing, is China. So the Chinese set up um, AVIC-1, the China Aviation Industry, um, which is state-owned, state-controlled, uh, with an extensive network of development, production, and related business operations. They've got 111 companies. 36 research institutes, six universities dedicated to aviation technology, 560,000 people working for AVIC. So this is quite obviously uh, a political choice by the Chinese government to become a big producer of commercial airlines. And why not? Why not do what Airbus did? Why are you importing Boeing when you could make your own aeroplanes? So, uh, Tang Xiaoping, AVIC-1 is the biggest aviation manufacturer in China. Our goal is to reach the level of big international aviation companies in the next 20 to 30 years. And they're on their way. The former British uh, and, uh, Prime Minister Tony Blair said, Airbus demonstrates we can achieve more together in Europe than we ever can alone. Working together in Europe means we can compete with anyone, anybody in the world. Well, that was before Brexit. Um, and the whole idea of Airbus, I think, is great. But we haven't done the same thing uh, in terms of allowing mergers uh, in train industry, in um, shipbuilding, in other industries. We are facing giant competitors from China and the USA. And sometimes the Commission doesn't allow certain mergers to take place. But maybe we, maybe we should rethink that, look at Airbus and say we need to have a sort of European cooperation for big companies in Europe to work together instead of working in competition with each other. So, well, we're going to look later on uh, in this lesson about what happened with the WTO dispute. Um, and the, the future producers uh, in the market. All the other links are on your website. Uh, back here. Uh, so uh, next, your next job is to look at Beluga. Beluga is the most amazing transport plane. There are only five of them uh, in the world. 
you can see them quite often uh, flying in and out of Nantes. It's really exciting. It, it should never be able to fly when you have a look at this plane. Take a look at the, the um, Airbus Beluga video. You then have an Airbus worksheet to take you through uh, visiting the Airbus website and to guide you to look at their comments concerning the WTO war um, and their position about it. You have an Airbus interactive map where you can see the production of Airbus uh, around the world. Um, and then uh, I'm going to do another short video about the WTO dispute and how that works and what the resolution uh, was. Uh, you got here the 2019 WTO arbitration. Um, and look, at it's, a, I think, uh, 150 pages. Only look at the conclusion. We'll, we'll have a look at that together and see how the USA is allowed to retaliate against the European Union. There's a short link as well about Boeing and Airbus at the WTO. This is produced by Airbus, so it obviously makes Airbus look like the goodie, even though it lost the case. Um, and you can also see this. In fact, I'm going to open that now because it's the future. Here it comes. If I can just find it. This. <laughs> This is called the Maverick. Of course, uh, working in a high technology industry like aeroplanes, you need to keep ahead of the game. And the idea is this is, this is the, um, uh, the ideas for the future of how people are going to be transported uh, around the world um, more quietly, more efficiently, uh, more economically. Um, so this is part of the, the, uh, the Airbus Maverick. Okay, follow your work guide and I'll get back to you in a moment with a short video about the WTO.